and welcome to the Remojo podcast. I'm Jack Jenkins, the founder and CEO of Remojo, the world's only complete app-based program helping conscious adults quit porn. We're on a mission to help as many people as possible wake up, quit porn, and get a lust for life. And you can join the movement at remojo.com. That's remojo.com. I'm here today with my guest, Benjamin Verbacek, who is a teaching pastor at Community Evangelical Free Church in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and the Managing Editor for Gospel Centered Discipleship. He and his wife, Brooke, have six children, and he blogs at Fan and Flame, he tweets at at Benjamin Verbacek, and is the co-author of Blogging for God's Glory in a Clickbait World and Struggle Against Porn, 29 Diagnostic Tests for Your Head and Heart, a book for Christians who need help to give up porn, and of course, the reason why uh, we we connected in the first place. Um, And I'm super happy to welcome him. So Benjamin, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me on, Jack. Cool. So basically, I, uh, yeah, I, I read your book, found it really interesting. That's, I guess, how we uh, mm-hmm. found out about you. We, we're always okay. looking for, you know, interesting uh, voices and perspectives and people talking mm-hmm. about this, this issue, which is still relatively uh, taboo at this point, um, mm-hmm. more or less so in um, the Christian world. And I'd be curious to find out like yeah. whether it's more taboo or less taboo. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll find out, but um, just, to, just to begin with, um, why don't you, you tell us a little bit about you know, your story and how you yeah. got into writing a whole book on quitting porn? Yeah, I, I will tell you, uh, the other guys at the church office had a good laugh or two um, at my expense talking about me during those months when I was off in some other room writing about pornography. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my book about porn was... Uh, was yeah misconstrued and, and a lot of funny jokes, but yeah. So I I'll tell you what I did not set out to do this. Um, you know, if you go back five, ten, fifteen, twenty years, um, I had my own troubles um, with sexual sin, which we could talk about in some other context. But like I, um, that wasn't the main driver of 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 why to write this, why to think about it. Basically, I you know for the last fifteen years, I found myself in the context of Christian ministry. Uh, meeting with guys who wanted to struggle um, against pornography. They they didn't want it in their lives. They thought it was wrong, and it was, of course, I agreed. But they just struggled to know what it looked like to actively struggle against it. And so so here I am, this pastor, and I'm I'm supposed to be helpful, and and yet I didn't really know how to be helpful, or at least as helpful as I thought I should be or could be. And I don't know that I would have used the word malpractice, um, Mm. but it was starting to feel like, you know, I'm bumping up against this issue so often with guys that are having such, I'll say guys, because I know it's broader than just men, but but my context where I was mostly doing my work was just, it was men who wanted to struggle with this, and I wasn't as helpful as I should have been. And, and so that set me on this course to, to read and think and write. And really, I just wanted a manual, not so much for the public, you know, to sell a book by any means, but really just for my own pastoral counseling to, to be helpful mm. to men. And, and so that's where, where it all started as far as the book is concerned. Uh, okay, so, so were you finding that within your ministry, within your church, that this topic was coming up so often, like with guys? Yeah, About, both like, very very often. Well, both and. I mean, it, not as often as it should. I, w- mm. Which is to say, it's it's going on more than it's coming up. But um, there were enough, and I took this as a sign of health. There was enough understanding of of the Christian concepts of grace and forgiveness that, that there was a safe place to make the struggles known. Not not publicly, not on a Sunday morning, stand up in front of tell, but like in in select groups with with particularly other men. They were discussing these things, and then with me as a pastor, there was. You know, it was, it was coming up often enough that you thought, okay, this is, like, if I'm getting a tenth of what's really going on, this is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what I found in my journey of, mm-hmm. with, you know, with the app and starting the, mm-hmm. starting Remojo is that similar to what you're talking about with the book, you know, everyone, yeah. all my friends are like, he's working on the porn app. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> the porn, no, yeah. it's, no it's, a, it's not a porn app. <laughs> it's, it's the opposite of that. Um, but yeah, I, so I started on the, on the process of that and can I, yeah, can I jump yeah. in and tell you one thing about, yeah, so yeah. like the book for me, like, so if it just the, the layout, like I, there's a number of Christian books on this, there's a number of just books, period, right? You go to Amazon, you find books. Um, but, but even in the Christian world, but, but what I was trying to do specifically is 
for, for me, and, and you've read this or maybe you've heard this, but why I might just say it's helpful to someone else if they thought it would be, would be to say, like, I'm not a car guy. I, I, you know, if something's wrong with my car, I'm bringing it to the shop. I, you know, I can tell what a flat tire has happened or the headlight goes out. But, um, but, you know, when you take your car and the check engine light comes on, you plug it into a diagnostic checkup, and, and, and it spits out all these results. And so for me, it was like I'm sitting in front of these guys, and they, they don't even know what's fully wrong. They're, they're like me as a car guy who's not a car guy, right? They, they're they're yeah. like struggling with porn, but they don't know why or they don't know how to fix it. And so to me, the book was just a way to say, okay, if I could plug my head into my heart <laughs> into a diagnostic checkup and, and bringing all that the Christian worldview has to bear on this subject in the best sense, um, what, what, what would it tell us to work on? And, and so the title is framed as struggle against pornography because I'll just say, I don't know if this is what you're experiencing, but I just found a lot of guys that were struggling not they would say, um, not they're struggling against it, they're struggling with it. Sort of this mm. passive, like, it's in my life, I don't really care, I know it's there, but they're not really doing anything. Yet. They, you know, deep down, they might have wanted to do something, but they weren't. And so I tried to frame it positively. Okay, what would it look like to work against it and, and to be proactive? So that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, um, and, and was that... Uh... So I read the book. Is you know it's very detailed. I, what I liked it was the you know it's very detailed and granular, and there's a ton of like very mm. specific sort of techniques or mental shifts or paradigms mm. concepts to explore. There's a lot of different things, and mm. it's it's funny how I guess in your process of talking to people and trying to solve this problem, you arrived at a similar approach to what we have. So at the moment, <laughs> as of th- as of this week. Um, in the app uh, we're updating our in-app courses where you know a lot of it is around specific concepts um, Mm -hmm. and mental shifts that you need to make followed by guided reflection questions sort of one to three (laughs) reflection questions sounds Um, familiar yeah to guide you through um, really thinking through the the process because I think that is a big part of it is you really have to think through everything and deconstruct and and break through the illusions Um, but it's, yeah, so it's very detailed. And, and as far as my reading of it, like a lot of it is just like so on the money in terms of my experience of, of helping mm. people with this problem through the app. So like, how did you actually develop your approach and, and arrive at the list of techniques yeah. and questions and concepts that you have in the book? Yeah, so it, it goes back a ways because I've been thinking, you know, I'm a local church pastor. I've been reading the Bible for, for years and years and and. and really since God changed me in the middle of college, which, which you know, the, that story, I, you know, I don't want to get preachy and go into all of that, but it, it really had to come face-to-face with my own brokenness and not being able to fix it myself. And so being around um, Christianity and hearing about the good news story of Jesus, which to me would have been a cliche years and years ago. I wouldn't have called it a cliche, but that, that's how I had received it. Uh, the Easter story, death and resurrection, what was that really about? And but, but for me, it, when I really looked at br- my own brokenness and thought, I, I can't fix this on my own. This is, it's too deep, too hard, too, too uh, the damage is, is, is too thick, not only in sexuality, but in other areas of life. For me, that's where the Christian story became compelling, of, of forgiveness mm-hmm. that comes from the outside and a, and a power from within to, to, to change. And, and so, anyway, so, so that all happened 20 years ago. And through that process, God slowly tugged me into pastoral ministry. So, yeah, just how did I come up with the 40 things? I think it's just been thinking about over the years and reading other books about what are the best Christian thinkers, but even I'll say just not Christian thinkers who are just thinking deeply about sexuality and what it means to um, live out this design that whether they're aware of it or not, I think God has given us for a gift. Um, and so that's, that's where it came from, just trying to ransack the Bible in the best sense for, for all that mm-hmm. it might say. Uh, to help help men and women struggle to to honor the Lord. Uh, which parts actually? Um, because of course, like as far as I'm aware, porn is not really dealt with directly in the Bible because there was no such thing no. at the time. So how how did you actually um, use it? And which which yeah. um, either passages, sections, whatever are mm-hmm. the most insightful guides yeah. for Christians dealing with this problem? Yeah, so the, the Bible actually has quite a bit to say about sexuality generally, um, and, and probably not in the ways that you know, some of your listeners might expect. Like, we're aware of the, you know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. That's at least the perception. Um, but I'll back up from that in, in a minute. But it's interesting, you talk about the Bible doesn't have much to say about 
pornography, the, the, the word for sexual immorality in the Bible is, the Greek word that is, at least in the New Testament, is porneia, which probably sounds okay. very familiar. So, so the Greek word is just this kind of junk drawer term for sexual sin is porneia, which of course we get pornography, the word from that. So yeah, the Bible has a lot to say about sexuality. And, and I, I think even in places where it's not explicitly saying something about pornography, it's saying about something about the goodness of God's creation and, and what it means to see that tarnished or ruptured. And so very early in the Bible, you have the story of, of, of Adam and Eve who are um, created in God's image to rule and reign over creation. They're like kings and queens, and um, God sets them up. And, and what's interesting is it's, you know, the end of chapter 2 in the book of Genesis, it's the beginning of the Bible, it says that... Um, they were, uh, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they two shall become one flesh. Maybe even secular weddings, that gets quoted at, at, you know, at weddings. But that's, mm-hmm. that's from the beginning of the Bible. But then it says, and they were um, naked and without shame. <laughs> so the, this idea at the beginning of the Bible has a man and a woman uh, naked, and there's no shame in it. So, so to me, that's the good backdrop that, that really the context of all the sin and all the brokenness and all the don't do this and don't do that really exists. It's really in the backdrop of God's good intention. So what happens in chapter 3 is Adam and Eve fall into sin. And what happens then immediately is they cover themselves with the, you know, the proverbial fig leaves, which for them were literal in the story, that they, they, they cover themselves in their shame. And so something about sin being introduced ruptured this... Um, thing that had no shame before. And so that, that, there's a lot that the Bible has to say about sexuality, but the beginning of the Bible is a really key place for me. Other, if you want, a, you want a few others? Is that what would be? Uh, yeah. Or, yeah, by okay. all means. Just a few. Just a few. I, I don't want to, I could go. Mm-hmm. I'm a Bible guy, so it could go for a while. But like, I think of um, all the dysfunction later in the book of Genesis and throughout what we call the Old Testament or sometimes called the Hebrew Bible, the parts of the Bible before Jesus is there. Um, it's, it's really, to me, illustrating, like, in sort of a backwards way, all the dysfunction when we don't follow the, the Lord and honor Him with this gift. It, he's given us a precious gift, and so it's showing us in illustrated ways what it's like to misuse that. But even in, like, you have a book of Proverbs, which is this collection of wisdom and how to live in ways that honor the Lord. And as much as it's saying, avoid the wayward woman, it's also telling you to enjoy in really passionate and provocative language, um, sex with your spouse. And so, anyway, just, I just mentioned that. In fact, there's a whole book called Song of Solomon, which is, in other, it's among other things, but it's, it's an erotic love poem between a husband mm-hmm. and wife. And so most people don't know that's in the Bible, uh, but it's certainly there. And uh, so those are some key passages, just even in the Old Testament. Yeah, I mean, um, my, uh, I suppose I had an ex- experience, which was that... Um, you know, my sort of first long-term relationship was with, actually with quite a strong Baptist uh, okay. Christian girl. And so mm-hmm. I ended up um, going along to uh, her church uh, quite a few times. Mm-hmm. And it was a student church. We were university mm-hmm. students at the time. And uh, I remember feeling like everyone was just so confused about sex. <laughs> I, don't know if you, I don't know if you would say that that's if you would agree with that summary, but maybe like, I was going to ask you, well, one, do you agree that that is kind of the situation? And if so, like in the Christian community, you know, why do you think everyone gets in such a bind with sexuality and gets so confused? Man, and that, <laughs> those are great questions. And I do, te- I, I'll just say right away, I tend to agree with you. And uh, yeah. I'd love to ask you follow-up questions about your, your okay. story there. I feel like you, you always get to ask all the questions, but I'll just, I'll answer yours for a minute is, I do think there's a lot of confusion about sexuality. There was a pastor a number of years ago who uh, had this quote that's always stuck with me. He said, um, it, he wasn't speaking as truth. He was speaking as like, what's the perception of sexuality in the church? And it's that mm. sex is dirty, gross, and, and wrong. So save it for the one you love. <laughs> so, I mean, like, so it's really bad. And so, you know, you, you preach at the youth, the kids in youth group, don't do it because it's bad, evil, gross. And then save it for the one you love. Like you're like, okay, that, that's not congruent there. That's, something's wrong there. And I think there's just part of the shame I talked about that gets introduced in the beginning of the Bible creeps into all of our lives in such a way that 
we can embarrass to talk about things that matter. If, if I was just telling my own story, I will tell you, um, we were doing premarital counseling uh, at the time, you know, my wife and I are about to get married, and you know, yeah. part of a Christian thing to do is you do this premarital counseling, and all that to say, uh, um, the pastor's sweet man, but his wife was a medical doctor, <laughs> and so thus more familiar with the body than I am, and she comes in during the intimacy session, and you know, talking about these things, and I'm freaking out. <laughs> Because I'm just so uncomfortable. Uh, part of my own sexual mm. sin, part of the upbringing I had where my parents were very modest and reserved, probably like this Baptist girlfriend grew up. Um, there yeah. just was this culture of you don't talk about these things. So now I'm a pastor, I'm doing counseling, I'm writing a book about pornography. It's, it's much more familiar to me, but by and large across our church or all churches, that's not the case. But, and, uh, and you think... You think it's because people basically um, they get started off on the wrong path, just with like a it just gets put in the this is wrong bucket, and then it's just difficult to get out to 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 get out of that again. And then the parents don't talk about it, and people don't talk about it enough, so it just becomes yeah taboo, right? Right, it is very much so. And you know, I like if I if I said on a Sunday morning I got maybe three hundred people. 350 people at our church and I said how many of you I wouldn't do this because the kids are some of them are in the audience but like congregation but like how many of you heard something helpful from your parents about sexuality when you were growing up like mm. you know not just the birds and bees but like an ongoing conversation where like this was a trusted person I mean almost no hands are going to go up yeah. and I think that's indicative of just how difficult this is in our context to talk about, which is why, you know, I wrote a book and I hope a hundred other good pastors write books about it too, because there, we're, there's, there's plenty of, uh, we're not have to fight over market share <laughs> um, <laughs> on these, on these books. That, I mean, yeah, that's for sure. Like, uh, I don't think, uh, I mean, in many ways, uh, I think we're way ahead of the curve, you know, like mm -hmm. I think, probably 99% plus of people don't even who are regularly using porn maybe don't even know that it's causing problems yet yeah. uh, or not really aware of how to diagnose the problems mm. yeah. um, that it's causing and uh, and how to name them and sort of describe them and so we're I think we're still very 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 early in terms of um, like getting the message out there and actually helping mm. people to quit like yeah yeah. Um, no, I agree. I think in the, in the to just say in the, in the church context, that's certainly true too. And, it, and it's got to change if, if um, we're going to be helpful to, to people because what, what, I've, what I have in my church, and I assume most pastors standing in the front of the church of, at, at, on any given Sunday, or a congregation that the previous night, many of them were looking at pornography. And mm. so there will just be this continual irrelevance as though... We're over here talking about these spiritual things, and yet where the rubber meets the road, where we're like we're actually living our lives, and where the struggles are, and the shame builds up, and the sin accumulates, we're not speaking to it. I think that's a that's a horrible pattern. And so, you know, you, you know, I've got kids in my sanctuary every Sunday morning, so you got to do it with some, uh, you know, some some tact and discretion. But I think. One of the beautiful things that our church has happened is there's a number of both guys and gals who are meeting in smaller groups to discuss these things. And there can be unhelpful to them this when they, you know, those groups can sometimes they don't get shepherding from the leadership of the church and they can become unhelpful. But, but generally in a, a church that's healthy and there's good teaching about sex that I think these groups can really thrive and be a benefit to people. Yeah, you know, I had a, a few things I wanted to just talk to you about actually directly from your uh, just from your book, right? Um, okay. I think there's quite a lot of interesting ideas in there. Um, actually, how, how long ago was it that you wrote the book as well? I'm just trying, I didn't um, see the publication date. Yeah, uh, 2019, so about two years okay. ago, uh, almost to the month. Um, just, just last month, um, the Spanish translation came out, so I can't oh, read nice. it myself, but <laughs> uh, it, it's out there now as well. Okay, cool. So. It's it's fairly fr fresh in, in the memory. I think, um, so there's one thing uh, that I thought, you know, was interesting. You talk about this concept of uh, cross-training, right, mm. as being very important. You know, can you, and I, I totally agree, can you kind of elaborate on that for, yeah. for the viewers? Well, so the idea of cross-training is, is you do something that's not your specific sport to get better at your sport. 
So, you know, um, you know a, a runner might, a sprinter in track and field, yeah, you can sprint, but you might also lift weights or even, I don't know, off season you play basketball or football or soccer, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, so, but, but that's the idea of cross training. So, so when it comes to, to pornography and, and, and seeing it come out of your life, I feel like um, the, one of the biggest determiners of, of the success um, is, is, is a character issue, not just simply strategies. I mean, the strategies are certainly helpful and, and they're the guardrails that, that can, can be there to protect you when uh, you're not driving the way you should, so to speak. But, but it's the character um, that actually needs the training. And so for, for me, thinking about pornography, there are certain, I think, um, aspects of your character that can make you more susceptible mm. um, to, to struggling against pornography or struggling with pornography. And so, so for example, the, the need for affirmation. Like if you are someone who constantly has to be affirmed, well, I think, well, pornography is great at that, sort of. Um, I mean, it's, it's not the route that long term uh, is good or even in the moment, I would say, from a Christian context. But it certainly makes you feel like that information. So anyway, the concept of cross training is working on your character so that um, you have the type of moral fortitude and character to struggle successfully. Yeah, I mean, that was a key realization that I came to as well, because when I started Remojo, I started out, I started out building a blocker, a mm. blocker app. Yeah. And, but what I realized is over time is that like if you block porn and then 90 days later you're still desperate to watch it it's not you know we haven't yeah. succeeded we have right. to first block it and yeah. then change the mindset um, and the beliefs and dispel mm -hmm. the lies and illusions yeah. that, around that at the same time you mm -hmm. got to block it because if you don't put any guardrails up in the early stages it can be very difficult for people to resist um, yeah. the temptation and the chances are they'll just keep reinforcing that habit yeah. um, every maybe at less frequent intervals but they'll still keep reinforcing that habit um, yeah. so you got to block but then you also have to yeah, change your character and your mindset yeah around I think it, both are really sure. important Hey, yeah. you mentioned lies and, uh, you know, just perceptions. Can, can I, I'd love to ask you a question, just mm -hmm. your perception of the religious community, specifically even, you know, a, a Christian pastor. What, what do you feel like are the perceptions that are out there um, related to sexuality and Christian pastors? Um, and, and you're not going to hurt my feelings, <laughs> by the way. Uh, I'd love yeah. to hear kind of the, your uncensored view. Yeah, I'm... I have the feeling that, uh, and so these would be guesses, I suppose, but mm -hmm. I, would, I would guess that um, whether you call it, uh, let's say in the religious community, you might call it sexual sin, in mm. the rest of the world, you might say bad habits, bad online mm. habits, right? Yeah. Um, I have the feeling that they are so ubiquitous that mm. I would imagine it's very, very likely um, that a very large proportion of the church, including the uh, ministry, the ministers, mm. are watching and using porn. It is mm. so widespread. Um, mm. And another thing is, like, from my personal experience of getting involved in, like, a university church, as I mentioned with mm -hmm. uh, one of my previous girlfriends, like, the guys there were, they basically had no fewer problems with, with, with sex and porn. They just had much more pain uh, and <laughs> guilt. Yeah. Um, but the, I think I have a, a sort of maybe a bit more insight than the average non-Christian because I've, I've been, I've gone pretty deep into that mm. community in a way. So yeah. you kind of realize that um, Christians are pretty much have all the same problems and everything is non-christians but they just yeah. feel about them in different ways and they have mm -hmm. um and they are thinking about them in different ways as well okay um and with a, a different mi a mindset of like really wanting to eliminate those problems rather yeah. than tolerating them or accepting them or normalizing them mm. that's the yeah. big difference is it's not normalized at all whereas yes. in everyday society it's completely normalized right 
Which makes it tough for, for the app you're trying to build too. When it, no, the normalization doesn't help uh, anybody, whether they have an ethical framework coming at it or, or just this, this makes me better or worse of a person. Yeah, mm. uh, that, that's helpful. I was curious what your perceptions were. I, I, think, I think you're, you're pegging it close. We, there, the struggles are within the church, even church leadership. And, and mm. that's, um, yeah, that's why it makes it all the more necessary to have the conversation we're having here. And I, I would just say, too, I think as I think about maybe a different approach from, from just a full on kind of secular approach. And I don't mean secular in a bad way. I just mean kind of yeah. without an explicit uh, connection to a God, if there is God, just just kind of what is good thinking about this. And I, so I mean that in a good sense, secular. Mm -hmm. But a difference between this explicitly Christian one would be a few full, like few different things. And I think one of them would be um, the ethical framework to me is actually a helpful thing because um, you know, like every January, everybody wants to be a different person when it comes around to December, right? Mm -hmm. they, you know, eat a little less calories or do this or that or, or, you know, work harder in this area of their life. But like, unless you have a real moral imperative that this is wrong, I, I think that's going to be tough to long term have success. And I listened to, you know, your previous guest, your, your first guest who was in, in the adult business and how wrong that was mm -hmm. as she experienced it. And, and I would say as the people watched it. And so I think having a, a this is wrong, um, while that's, you know, sometimes the Christian community is characterized as that's all we say. It's actually a helpful thing to say because um, I know if I want to lose weight, but there's a tub of ice cream <laughs> in my fridge. Like, I don't know if it's, I'll be, I'll worry about that tomorrow and just eat the ice cream today. And I think an actual imperative that this is wrong, it helps people struggle against pornography. I think it's a really good point um, and I think going back to your book there's a chapter about essentially developing a, a hatred for it mm. as a as a concept yeah. or a thing you're not hating yeah. any individual people but developing a hatred for that that thing yeah and I think that's a useful model because I think yeah again if you were really trying to lose weight you wouldn't just want to see ice cream you would no longer want to see ice cream as a treat you would want to see it as something that sabotages yeah. who you want to be yeah um, and is loaded with sugar in a fairly cynical way to try mm -hmm. and exploit your um, uh, evolutionary hooks um, mm -hmm. for sugar and fat yeah. um, for like commercial gain essentially and mm -hmm. you if you if you build up that kind of um, charged uh, negative feeling towards ice cream that will help you to quit yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I do feel like that's a useful model um, and something that we've kind of started working on a little bit but want to work on more is you know um, you have to I think we have to expose the supply chain and the kind of human yeah. misery that is being created by mm -hmm. the consumption of this and every time every guy that is watching this is is casting a little vote with their eyeballs for yeah. this continuing yeah um, or growing I think that's really true. You know, maybe I'd love to say something here about that, 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 yeah. that a real significant, so we're, ice cream's fine. We're not, <laughs> Christians don't <laughs> hate ice cream. I just want to be clear. I like ice cream. Actually, I, well, I, I can't eat ice cream because uh, I became allergic to dairy in a very strange way. So that's unfortunate. But um, I do like ice cream. But um, what, what I would say is the, the difference between kind of pseudo-Christianity and real Christianity is very significant here on this point because there is this ethical framework of right and wrong. So what do we do with all the wrong that we're continually doing? Mm -hmm. I think that's where real Christian teaching is differentiated from kind of the perception, at least as I sometimes think people think of Christianity or even have thought a lot about it in my own life for, for long periods of time growing up, like that Christianity was just about doing right. The beautiful thing to me about Christianity is that the ethical framework is not the center. Um, the center to me... Um, is, is a real way that shame is dealt with. So I, I don't want to get super preachy, but I'll just, in, in short, I just think the, the story of a, a Savior who dies in your place absorbs to himself all of your sin and shame and failings and, and dies in your place and receiving the judgment I should have endured myself and then rises again triumphantly. I th and so that therefore the, the relationship I have with God is that when he sees me, he doesn't see sinful Benjamin who's looked at pornography and sinned in a thousand other ways. He sees the perfections of his son, Jesus. And I think that message uh, to me is, is really compelling because it lets us, 
in true Christianity, deal with that shame that does build up. Like, I, I was listening to another one of your guests, and it, it's not, I don't mean this adversarial or, or just differences of how we're looking at this, but I think it's really good to tell someone, I, I so totally agree with what another guest said about that, you know, sharing with someone, getting that shame out in the open in a very strategic way is really helpful. But, like, I don't know, I was just thinking about it. If I told my son to clean his room and he just put it all in the closet, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like my son has taken spoiled milk and do his, he drinks chocolate milk and sets it in his room and like a month later, like, it, this is a true story, like it started stinking. So like, I, like it, it doesn't really go away with it, but, but Christianity, to me at least, has the idea of really cleaning the room and starting fresh. Um, and so that's, that's why, to me, Christianity is compelling. It's not just the ethical framework, but also the, the real way to deal with shame, at least as I understand it. And, and so, actually, just to sort of clarify, you mean like when you say the real way to de deal with shame, you mean is in uh, uh, yeah. that you excise that to yeah, you know, so there's to something else, so you don't feel it internally, you mean? You well, so there's, there's, it's a both and. Like, I, I really think there, there, there's a sense in which, yeah, I want to deal with pornography and deal with other things in my life so that I become a better person. I agree with that. But, but if, there, if there really is a, a God and a creator who's made things up and has attention for the world um, and, and, and gives sex to us as a gift and that I've misused personally, then, then therefore, like what, what happens to that shame and guilt on a kind of vertical level between me and God? That's mm -hmm. sort of what I'm saying, like that, that cleaning of the room. Now, on a, so that's where Christianity deals with that. But it also... <laughs> Um, as we begin to follow the Lord and, and, and He changes our lives, um, hopefully that begins to then deal with on, on a one-to-one, -one, a person-to-person -person, uh, relationship and the actual outworking of my life, um, the shameful living and, and how I deal with other people. And, 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 and so hopefully then it begins to then work on that too. So it's, I, I kind of meant it as a both end, the abstract concept of forgiveness, but also then what happens then in my actual lived experience. Mm. Yeah, what, what do you think, uh, I'm curious, so, you know, at Remojo, we're very much at the beginning of the journey of, of, of getting the app and the, the program mm -hmm. out there, you know, um, we're heading towards about 100,000 downloads, I hope so there'll be people, I hope there'll be people watching this uh, fairly soon who will see, oh, they've come a, they've come a long way since then, <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, you know, we need to reach a lot more people, and um, we really think there'd be a, a, a lot of appetite for the program and the app in the Christian community. I mean, do you have any advice for reaching Christians and how to reach them on this, this issue? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I th well, I, th <laughs> I think you could get bigger names than me. I'll just be <laughs> candid on your, your podcast. Uh, I'm not much of a, a Christian celebrity, even though that's, that's not even the best you know, thing to shoot, aspire in your life is to become a Christian celebrity. But, but I, I think d doing what you're doing here of reading a book that, that maybe even doesn't, you know, has overlap with what you would believe on your own and then also has some probably differences, maybe even some things yeah. I said that rubbed you the wrong way. I think your, um, you, which I really appreciate, this is why I'm so excited to be here, is, is the demeanor you're carrying yourself with and openness to ideas and encouragement. Really, I think that just that we're having this dialogue will go a mm -hmm. long ways into making, um, you know, the friendship between what you're doing, I think, in a really good way and what Christians might be doing explicitly in their own context in local churches. Yeah, um, I guess uh, you, you've probably come across um, uh, Fight the New Drug, right? Probably heard mm, of it. Yeah. 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 Um, so one thing I've noticed about maybe uh, Christian organizations like Fight the New Drug and even in the language in your book as well is that you do use the word you, you use very combative terminology, right? Yeah. So it's struggle, it's fight, uh, it's battle. Um, mm -hmm. Why, why, that's a very conscious choice, right? For sure. And it's, and I, and I would say that it's, a, um, and I know that because I would say that I've steered away from that language yeah. uh, with Remojo. I'm just yeah. interested, like why you've made that conscious choice to, I guess, give it that power, right? You really give something yeah. power when you say that you have to fight or struggle with it. Yeah, I think I love that you noticed that. It was a conscious choice. I don't know that's how, that's the language I would always use. That's not the language I'm using on Sunday morning every week or whatever. Not that I, this is coming up, you know, as often maybe as it should. But um, in a book geared towards men, mm. um, I feel like 
there's symmetry there with the way I'm talking about it, with the way the Bible itself talks about it. And so, um, and, and, and partly I'm trying to shock a tame audience, you know, an audience that's sort of like become passive and it's domesticated and, and, and to wake us up. I'll use the language of us, not just them, us, me, mm-hmm. men, to, to um, yeah, embrace um, the challenge as something that's worth fighting for. And I, again, there I'm using the language of fighting for it. I, I, I think that to me, yeah, it can be overdone. Like, I, I think there's a section of the book where I try and say, like, th- this can be overdone. Honestly, I get uncomfortable. Like, I see a conference for a men's conference, and, like, they're shooting guns and driving monster trucks, and then they bring in, you know, guys they are going to box in the octagon or something. Like, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, that is way too much. You, you have turned up the tost- testosterone to 11, and that is, that's, that's turning me off. Um, but, but, but I do think there's a way to undersell this in such a way that like, well, you know, if you want to be a better person, then do this or that. Like, I, I think it's a much bigger deal than just that. So I'm trying to arouse that kind of fight language and that instinct to say like, th- this is something that, that can't just be, we can't coddle and be involved in our life in a passive way. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, well, can I, let me ask you, yeah. why, why have you, do, do, tell me the opposite. Why have you intentionally stayed away from the language? I'd love yeah. to hear that. Because I don't know yeah. that, that, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'd just love to hear why you did that. Yeah, so I, I feel like um, there are a few reasons. So one is I feel like that gives it a lot of power, right? And, mm. and the more power you give it, the more justification and excuses people have for continuing on as they are. Mm. Um, and making you, you, I feel like it makes it something that people can't just, they don't have a feeling that they're like, I can just, I can just block this and stop and be free. And that'll be that I can walk away. Um, and yes. that creates some resistance to starting yes. the process uh, to, and to maybe um, buying into uh, the program and mm-hmm. really feeling like a level of confidence because a lot of the people that are struggling with porn don't have high confidence um, yeah. in themselves, in their, mm-hmm. in their competence. In, in their ability to make changes in their life. Yeah. And the porn usage actually reinforces that. It makes them feel less and less competent. Yeah. And, in, and like the discipline, like they don't have self-discipline, like they have low willpower, like they're weak. Mm-hmm. And um, I've, I wanted to steer away from any kind of words like uh, addict, addiction, yeah. um, and um, fight, struggle, mm-hmm. um, because I feel like it can maybe for the people that are at a low level of personal development and many of which, to be honest, many of the people that are struggling with pornography are at quite a low level of personal yeah. development overall, because it goes yeah. back to what you're saying about character. Mm-hmm. Um, what I find is that the way that you talk to people is so important for coaching them. Just I've found this in life generally. Yeah. Talk to people like a winner and they're much more likely to become a winner. Um, whereas yeah. talk to people like they're weak and there's a possibility that they will continue to be to be weak yeah. so that well was i agree with a thinking. lot of that i yeah i, I, I yeah I, I hope i didn't talk to people as though they were weak <laughs> i think there's an an agency that that with god's help we can overcome this in, in a really powerful way but i do i i i, I want to just say i i completely affirm that some for some people this becomes such an overriding concern even in the best sense mm-hmm. where they're like i want to stop this and this is a big deal and i got to change but some of the guys we're working with here, I, like what we say is, okay, we got to stop talking about this. We're going to talk about all these other things in your life, your job, your family, if you have family or, or aspirations or goals or, or just anything. What, do you, get a hobby uh, yeah. because, be, because this like insistence on constantly focusing on pornography is not the way you're going to get victory over it because it does have, then it just takes on this you know, enormous proportion in your life, way, way more mm-hmm. than it should. So I agree. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, and by the way, I don't think it's like, I don't have a really strong disagreement. I just found that basically my, um, when I was first starting out with, with the app, I was mm-hmm. really interacting on a daily basis, very, very directly with users of the app. Yeah. And what I just found was like a lot of them were just in such a, a dark place and a, mm-hmm. a weak place, actually, mm-hmm. I would say yeah. that they... That what I, I just I tested a lot of different ways of reply of responding to people and what I found was the direct one the the, yeah. the direct almost like uh, 
fairly, you know, a little bit hard. Um, yeah. Actually, like stirred something in some in some of these people um, where they're like, okay, yeah, yeah. I get it. Um, but that's yeah. but it, I think it's uh, I can see why you would choose that, especially from a, a Christian perspective, because well, and, oh. it's evil. It's a good versus evil thing. Yeah. I want to say something about that because you. What, what I'm doing in, in, in that book or what other people might be doing in that, that context, taking that hard line, isn't to say that's the summation of how Christianity approaches that. It, it's, mm. I'm, I'm trying to do one thing, hoping brothers and sisters in Christ will, will also do other things to round out what is the whole message. Because I, mm. I, 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 I'm certainly not trying to say I have the monopoly or this is the right way to do it. I think for the right person it might be that. But you might find this interesting. One of the best-selling books in Christianity today over the last year, and it's just enormously selling because it's it's an unlikely seller it's okay. called Gent- gentle and lowly and and it's about god's posture towards those who struggle and it and it's drawing a verse for it's called matthew chapter 11 verse 28 where jesus looks out at this crowd they're they're harassed and helpless it says and he says that the passage says that jesus had compassion on them um and and he said he looked out the crowd and said come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and i will give you rest and, and so this book, from an evangelical uh, perspective on Christianity and sin and salvation and Jesus, is selling like hotcakes because it, it's only doing what you're speaking gently to those who are struggling. And so I'm so thankful that's happening. So don't hear what I'm saying. It's saying like, well, I'm the only way. Uh, I'm thankful that book is selling as a, as a good compliment to what I'm trying to do. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, as you said, there's really we're at a stage where there's no competition. We need a lot of different approaches. Yeah. We just need to like there's people um, we had uh, on the podcast last week. It hasn't gone out yet, but you know they have a charity that's that's literally just raising awareness of mm. the problems that porn causes, right? So and then this um, you might be familiar with like Exodus Cry, who are working yeah. on more like uh, combative strategies versus porn sites themselves and against trafficking and things. Mm-hmm. So the space for a lot of yeah. a lot of perspectives and a lot of voices i think um just going back to like something um that's kind of not really in the thread of what we're talking about but just something that i, I wanted to ask you because um we will have a lot of um christians uh mm-hmm. you know watch this um and we do get uh, many uh spiritual users of different faiths um as well um so i guess one of the it's maybe uh, not uniquely, but particularly difficult uh, for Christians to deal with porn, I guess, because um, generally the serious Christians are, I suppose, trying to be celibate to some extent mm-hmm. um, and before marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, what advice do you have? What advice do you have for cr- single Christians that aren't yet married? Um, because I feel like that is a particularly difficult struggle because there's no outlet essentially yeah well true true i would just say you know putting on a wedding ring um and getting married doesn't doesn't change that either like it's at least you know the perception i think to the single guy that's probably one of the things i would want to say and, and do say to the single guys in our church is like you know you, you think you're fixing this now and you're working on it hard on it so that you know you you this <laughs> This paradise of sexual intimacy that happens in marriage. Well, I hope uh, marriage is a place of sexual joy um, for the men in our church and all churches and Christians. Uh, but um, I think we can overestimate that. And so um, I, these same struggles to, to not look with lust at a woman that's not my wife um, actually apply still to me here as a pastor of a church and a dad of a bunch of kids and and like I still struggle in my heterosexual lust uh, to, to, to not um, against sin and so anyway that, that that's one thing I'd want to say to these young men I, I don't know if that's a helpful maybe that's more discouraging uh, but maybe it, it just raises the, the incentive and the urgency to, to try and work on this is that getting married doesn't fix this it, it, it's going to be a lifelong struggle with you mm. um, if you don't address it in singleness or in marriage? I think, um, yeah, I, I think there's something really actually profound there, which is that you basically, um, 
you cannot find lasting satisfaction in sort of another person cannot really give you lasting satisfaction in your life has to come from within Um, and that is actually the problem (laughs) fundamentally (laughs) so trying to get um, satisfaction from other people and rather than Mm. you know deriving it from within right yeah yeah so tell me tell me more about that what do tell me more what you mean by that um well clearly there's no real correlation between um peop- you know what you sort of have uh and your happiness because you can have a you know yeah. a monk um sitting right. in prayer or meditation all day long with nothing who is blissfully happy and you can have people we all know people that have got plenty or have got everything that are miserable so i think it's and i think uh i think people figured that out at least two thousand years ago probably more (laughs) you know um and um and so but I, i feel like the more people chase happiness from some external source the Mm -hmm. the more elusive it is and what it fuels is just a rising dissatisfaction that becomes almost a frenzy and then because that turns into addictive or compulsive behavior so that's what again i don't you know i i'm kind of a singing the same song but i think that's the beauty of christianity is that joy and happiness pursues you that that's the story of christianity is, is that the God who created things comes after you and, and changes you from the inside out so that you do have an internal satisfaction and joy that, that can exist um, in sexual celibacy or in, in marital intimacy or with a job promotion or when you get fired, uh, when you have COVID, when you don't have COVID, like what, whatever it is going on in your life, at least in the spiritual concepts, there's this a source of contentment and joy that that comes from the outside that comes into the inside that that's at least what the christianity would teach yeah it's like if you can't be happy single don't you know you're not going to be oh <laughs> happy no in a relationship either there's this lie uh, there's an old movie do you remember the movie you probably i don't know i'm a couple years older than you but cool runnings the bobsled movie <laughs> it's like uh, i haven't seen it actually uh, I, I remember all my friends like yeah yeah well into it but i haven't seen it yeah it's a, it, it's, it's a silly and, and fun movie at the same time, but this bobsled team from Jamaica, you know, makes the Olympics. But, but there's this line about a gold medal where the guys, you know, they're trying to win this gold medal. He's like, hey, if you weren't enough before you had the gold medal, you're not going to be enough with it. And, mm-hmm. and that's why I think as much as Remojo and, and even myself are trying to talk about pornography, like there are bigger things at stake than whether someone's in pornography or not in pornography, and in fixing those bigger things and defining those bigger things and even asking those questions, um, I think will be the ultimate source of like kind of in a backwards way coming around to, to fixing the problems with sexuality. Yeah, I mean, what I found is that um, a lot of the people that come to our app is basically like they have this vision of the thriving man that they want to be and really mm. quitting porn is just like, the first thing they need to do to get the journey started and we're just for that very that's almost like the very first step because it's like yeah. you know you're not at your best if you're doing that all the time yeah right yeah. that's just obvious so it's a very very obvious first step for a lot of people in in terms mm. of um yeah realizing their vision for who they yeah. want to be um but it's yeah by no means the end it's like literally the very first step uh, which is why so much I- to do after that yeah, I love your little promo where it's, you know, get a lust for life. Like, I mm. like, I like that. So you, you talk about language and struggle and path, whatever you want to say. Like, you're, you're doing something provocative there with that, that, that tagline, and, which I love, is, is to get a lust for life. That, that, that pornography, it, there's a sense in which you'd say, okay, it, yeah, this is the, it's not just the first step on going on to some other thing. In some ways, it is the first step in, like, going on to a holistic life that, that embraces all that creation has to enjoy yeah yeah um cool so so ben what what are you what are you working on at the moment well it's funny yeah so you're catching me at a fun time i am actually on the the sabbatical they call it so i've been at my same church for seven years and which means they've given me more like a teacher's schedule this year so i have it's it's summertime i have the summer off so i came over to the church basement (laughs) to, to to talk to you but in general i'm 
I'm reading some books, I'm hanging out with my kids, I'm, I'm doing some writing projects, but I'm also just exercising and playing a lot and resting after seven really hard years. Uh, this last year in, in local churches, uh, just a lot of people's lives, was really hard. And so yeah. um, I'm thankful to have a little bit of time to rest so that when we start back in the fall, I'll be hopefully a healthy pastor again. Yeah, man, well, that sounds... Sounds pretty ideal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I'm, like, there's a, I, I'm telling, strategically telling people and telling them, okay, don't be jealous. <laughs> but uh, it, it's been a sweet time. I'm, so I'm spending time with kids. I'm going to a lot of, ba- I like basketball and other things. And so, but I've, I've got some writing projects. None of them are, are fully formed too, too much yet worth talking about. But those are sorts of things I've been working on. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. So I think, uh, yeah, I would just kind of remind everyone about um, your book, uh, Struggle Against Porn, 29 Diagnostic, Diagnostic Tests for Your Head and Heart. I would highly recommend it. Um, is there any other ways that you would like any of our viewers to kind of interact uh, with you, uh, yeah. engage with your work, anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, home, home base is uh, for me just kind of the, the website I have. It, it's just my first and last name, but my last name is Verbacek and no one can spell it. So uh, Fan and Flame is, is also the same. Get, fanandflame.com gets you to the same place. And so, yeah, I'd love for people to find me there. I've taken a break from social media, not so much from the, the pornography or lust standpoint, more it's just kind of become a toxic place. So I, I have all mm. those. <laughs> um, <laughs> those handles or whatever we want to call them, but I, I'm not there as much as I used to be. Yeah, I'm not a, um, not a huge believer in social media either. I think it's better to yeah. really just connect with people in the real world and just, you know, mm-hmm. um, use it for messaging, use it to set up things in the real world. But like I try, yeah. to, I try to just keep it at that generally, yeah. um, personally. So yeah, I'm kind so of you on that one. Years ago, I lived in England, a tiny, I think oh, that's really? where you're coming from, right? Where, where are you yeah. at? Uh, we're in London, yeah. London, okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I lived in a little town called Weatherby. Um, it's, it's near a town called Leeds, uh, which oh, is right. much yeah, bigger, yeah. much bigger, yeah. Yorkshire. Uh, yeah. But that was when I was a kid, so it's been oh, a while. Yeah. I'd love to go back, though. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm vaguely familiar. I mean, yeah, I, I'm from the northeast as well, from the northeast okay. of England, so... Yeah. Um, cool. Well, Ben, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Remote Your Podcast. Thanks, Thanks for having a lot. Me. Yeah. Thank you very much.